My name is Lu Lan Yu. I'm the Education Programs Manager, BMFA. And um, welcome to our virtual 3 and 30. Um, we are welcoming Dr. John Henry Rice, the Carpenter Curator of South Asian Art, who will give a 3 and 30 talk this morning on Rathal Himalayan deities. And this uh, particular, this tour this month is inspired by um, the special exhibition, exhibition Saren Sherpa Spirits, which is on view. If you haven't seen it, it is up through um, October 16th. So please do see it. And if you have seen it, see it again. So it's worth it. Thank you, John Henry. And I will turn it over to you now. All right. Um, thank you, Luan. For, for this presentation, I've taken a few pictures within the galleries because I'd, li I'd like to really kind of virtually try to take you there and, and, and impress upon you um, my, my um, belief that, that this, uh, although this is great um, to be able to do this, and, and, and um, I'm, I mean, I'm in Lexington, Virginia right now to be able to do this with, with me here and you guys there, wherever you are, um, um, it's really no... Um, it's it's really no substitute for for seeing the, the real art. So please please um, um, do that when you are able. Um, now all I have to do is figure out how to advance my slides. There we go. So as as Lulan said, this uh, program is inspired by the by the Sherpa Spirits exhibition that's up. Um, please please uh, um, not only go see it again, but tell everyone you know to go see it. Um, um, and that would be great. Of course, um, Sherpa, um, as, as I think most of you know by now, you know, was trained as, as a traditional artist, traditional Tibetan uh, Tonka painter, um, um, and, 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 and um, so, so that's why now we're, we're going into the galleries and looking at, at traditional work. Um, of course, Sherpa's um, contemporary work. So, so on this slide, you see above um, one of, well, in fact, his last and really sort of, in my opinion, greatest um, um, traditional work. Uh, and then on the bottom, some of his contemporary uh, things. Of course, his contemporary things take elements from that traditional imagery and, and transform them in one and another way. You'll recognize um, not only that, that top painting, but then the two flanking paintings below as, as having been in Awaken, um, and then um, the one in the center there uh, in the Spirits exhibition. And Sherpa um, talks about um, one, of the, one of the many things in the catalog that I note is, is that he talks about him personally being sort of more, um, more influenced by the wrathful deities uh, in Tibetan Buddhism's very vast pantheon. Um, you know, but, but, but him really sort of taking to the wrathful deities more than the uh, sort of benevolent, peaceful deities in, in that pantheon. And of course, it's, it's the wrathfuls that, that influence um, the sort of creation of his, of his spirit's character, um, um, which is traced in that exhibition. Um, so the, these are uh, sort of examples of the three, the three and 30, the three particular wrathful deities that, that I will um, present. But first, just sort of more generally, I mean, if, if one spends any time at all with, with traditional Tibetan uh, art, you will notice that there is a whole lot of frightening and sort of macabre imagery uh, in, in Himalayan or Tibetan Buddhism. And with this seems, uh, at, at first glance, this seems sort of odd um, or a paradox anyway, that, that a philosophical and sort of spiritual system whose goal is um, the sort of the realization of complete equanimity might be so full of, of unsettling imagery. Um, in part, this is explained um, sort of historic, well, all explained historically, but in part, this has to do with the habilitation of, of Buddhism into Tibet. You know, Buddhism starts in India and, of course, uh, makes its way around the world. But when it comes to Tibet, of course, it's not coming into a vacuum. And there um, was a, a, a long and established tradition of animistic 
um, deities there, many of whom uh, were fearsome. So that's, that's part of the explanation that people often turn to of why Tibetan Buddhism is so much more full of this imagery than some other forms of Buddhism. And, and there's certainly something to that. Um, but it's important to note that this, um, these terrifying deities and startling imagery um, was, was not new to Buddhism when Buddhism came to Tibet. Um, it, had, it had started in India sometime earlier with the development of Buddhism's Vajrayana traditions. This is the, the sort of um, um, school or, 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 or a phase of, of, of Buddhism that, that takes hold in Tibet called the Vajrayana, um, which itself still back in India was, was part of, of a sort of growth of, of tantric practices and a variety of, 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 of um, practices, not, not just in Buddhism, but in Hinduism, et cetera. Um, but this Vajrayana um, offers the possibility of a, of a quick route to enlightenment as opposed to some of the earlier forms of Buddhism. So uh, a, a quick path uh, to enlightenment or, or to, coming, to coming to that realization of that equanimity um, and, and to coming to the realization of actually the fallacy of dualities, um, including good and bad, sacred and profane, and, and by sort of demonstrating the fallacy of those dualities by, in fact, emphasizing them. Um, so this is why you're getting some of this really shocking imagery, you know, emphasizing those dualities sometimes in very, very stark um, in, in sort of putting them in your face and, and shocking you out of the, your, the conventional beliefs that, that such dualities are opposites and not instead just sort of um, different areas on a sort of continuum of awareness. So, um, okay, F philosophy aside, because I can barely wrap my head around it, um, but, but back to these wrathful deities themselves. Um, basically, um, it's, in, it's important to, to keep in mind that their, their fearsomeness is not, um, it's not directed to, to the practitioner, um, but to, you know, to that seeker of knowledge along the path. Their, their wrath is not directed at, at the practitioner, but instead at the enemies uh, of the obstacles along, you know, the obstacles that stand in the way of that seeker's journey towards enlightenment. So in, in, in basic, you know, basically they, they are allies of, of the Buddhist practitioners, not enemies. So that's, that's um, you know, sometimes um, I, I, re I read something recently about, um, you know, tr trying to, to um, explain this seeming paradox, um, you know, that, that um, a mother, this is the way it was expressed, you know, you um, imagine a, a mother um, who loves her child very much, like most mothers do, and, um, and that child is threatened. And so that, that loving, compassionate um, being can become, can become very frightful in protecting um, um, her child. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's just important, you know, they're not demons, monsters. They are, they are in fact, powerful allies of, of the Buddhist practitioner. Um, so as I mentioned, these are the three um, deities uh, represented in the permanent galleries um, um, that, that I'll just sort of delve into a bit. So the first of these, um, Vajravarahi, um, the, literally the, the lightning sow, um, she, um, th there's, there's no direct connection really between Vajravarahi. I'll show you there are two examples currently in the gallery. This is one of them. Um, there's no direct connection between this and, and the Sherpa uh, material, unlike the, the next two. But, but really, I'm, um, I've brought Vajravarahi into this. Um, she is a wrathful Himalayan deity. Um, but to highlight a couple of recent acquisitions, um, this, this being one of them. Now, um, Vajravarahi is, is sort of well known um, as the consort to Chakrasamvara. Um, one of one of Tibetan Buddhism's sort of principal meditation deities, and so I actually have three um, just have to, three examples of these are up in the gallery as well. Um, one sculpture and two two gorgeous paintings um, showing her in that role of of consort 
uh, to Chakrasamvara. So she's the red figure in the two paintings. Um, um, in in um, physical union with, with uh, Chakrasamvara, the male deity there. Um, but she also, and, and, and those, and so here now I'm taking into the galleries, those three, those two paintings and the sculpture are there. But really what I want to direct you to is this corner um, back here. It's where you come in the doors near the elevator. And these are the two recent acquisitions that show um, Vajravarahi um, by herself. And so um, she, I mean, she is by her own right, one of the tradition's most prominent and powerful deities. Um, she's understood to be a fully enlightened Buddha, a really an embodiment of enlightenment itself. Um, the, she, she is, so uh, you, you will, if you don't know already, you'll come to discover with, with the, the Tibetan Buddhist pantheon, it is very vast and there are always um, many, many forms of, of, of deities. So, so and there's sort of these, these nesting layers of, of, of um, hierarchies and, 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 and forms of, of particular deities. Vajravarahi is herself a form of the sort of um, original prototype female tantric deity called Vajra Yogini. Um, you don't need to worry about that necessarily. Um, but Eve, and, and, and she um, come, she her, herself, Vajravarahi, comes in many forms. This dancing, sort of semi wrathful in fact, form is, is the one that most prominently appears in art. But she comes in a variety of forms herself, um, um, varying from, from actually benevolent to very, very wrathful, even more so. Um, that name, the lightning style, Vajra, so Varahi means a, a, a female boar. Um, so her sort of cognizance, the way that you can recognize Vajra Varahi um, is she almost always has a sow's head, um, which appears um, variously sort of coming out the side of her head as there in the bronze um, or, or on top of her head there in the painting. Um, so, um, so this, so as I said, e even even this dancing form of her comes <laughs> comes in various forms. So traditionally, most commonly, she is red, like like she was in those Yabium paintings that I, I showed a minute ago. So it, this the um, bronze here very well probably was once painted red. She, um, but she also comes in other sub forms, and and the painting here is uh, her form known as Crota Kali, the, the fearsome black one. Um, and, you know, but, but regardless of her color here, her, her iconography is pretty stable in this, in this uh, particular form. Um, you know, she's, she's fierce or semi-wrathful, fanged. Um, she's ornamented with, she wears bone jewelry and a garland of severed heads, you can see these features in, in either the, the painting or the sculpture there. Um, she holds a knife with a curved blade, um, um, which is paired with the, the skull bowl that, that is in her other hand. The curved blade um, being meant to, to be able to dip down into the skull bowl and um, chop up, this, this is all metaphor, right? But chop up the, the, the sense organs um, that, that are in, in the skull bowl. Um, it, this is symbolic of um, you know chopping up those 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 uh, organs associated with the senses um, to to prevent the senses from hindering one's understanding of, of, of ultimate reality. Um, I'll, I'll I'll just note that the curved blade of of the the bronze um, was missing, long gone when we uh, uh, purchased this piece. And um, our conservators, if you go see this, when you go see this in the gallery, um, you'll notice that she has a, a beautiful um, curved blade there again. And our conservators did a fabulous job of, of making a, a replacement blade for the long missing one. Um, it, it, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know that it's uh, a replacement, but I, I do mention it in the label because um, I, I wouldn't want someone to mistake for the original. Um, Vajra Varahi, um, as I said, 
these wrathful deities are allies, and, and so Vajra Varahi is, is in, a, in a group of, of female deities that are often referred to as Dakinis, um, which uh, translates or can translate to Skywalkers. And, and they um, are known for their role in assisting right, the, the aspirant um, in their pursuit of enlightenment with, with their sort of great power and energy, the dynamism that you see here um, in, in her stance. Um, with, with the power and energy that they are um, able to provide the, the practitioner with shortcuts. Um, as I said, um, the, the quick path uh, toward enlightenment. So shortcuts through the, through the eons of time that it would normally require one to, to reach awakening. Um, and these really are gorgeous examples. The, the painting um, on the left here is, is a tiny painting. It's probably, I don't know, um, um, two, three inches wide. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's maybe six inches. I don't know. I, it's, it's small, like a playing card, a little bit bigger than a playing card. And um, one can really sort of get, um, just sort of fall into it when you, when you start looking at it closely. Um, it's a 16th century work that's actually painted in, a, in, a, in an earlier style. Um, and then the, the bronze is, 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 is a 13th century, a, a, a pretty old uh, in bronze. And, and again, it's, it's wonderful. I have wanted um, Bhadrarahi, as I said, she's very important, a deity in Pantheon. And until this time, we only had one tiny little painting of her that was on a 12th century. Um, in fact, I have a detail. Um, on the left here, this is a tiny little painting that's on a um, palm leaf manuscript. Uh, in our collection, um, but but it's been on my list for a while to develop our holdings of Vajrahi imagery, and so to that, adding to that tiny painting, we now have the, the slight, the bit bigger and and um, painting and and the bronze that you've just seen, and then we also have, and I will be very excited to debut this at some point when the conservators are finished with it, but this really really actually important large early. Um, Nepalese painting of, of the same um, figure. And, um, and it's the, this, so I've, I've kind of gotten into a budget variety jack and, and, and it, it has me thinking that, that maybe in the future at some point, uh, maybe doing a show on um, Bhadra Yogini, the, this, this uh, deity and, and her um, sort of very, various functions with, within the tradition. Um, it's good stuff, I think. Um, okay, so moving on, since we're, yes, moving on. Um, the second of these deities, Mahakala, I, br I bring um, um, him into the discussion um, and into the galleries, um, more to do, I mean, now we're getting closer to the Sherpa material. It's, it's actually um, Mahakala who um, directly inspired uh, Sherpa's creation of, of the spirit figure. You, you'll, um, the, the face in, in, in his original spirit painting um, was taken from Mahakala iconography. And um, so I wanted to highlight him in the galleries. Mahakala comes in dozens of forms and variations. Um, and so I have four up in the galleries. Again, I'm taking you back in. I'm showing you where these four paintings of Mahakala are in the galleries. Um, these are the four again. Um, as I say, it comes in all these uh, very various forms, um, four of which you get here um, associated. I mean, he can be a meditation deity, but really he is, um, he is really the tradition's foremost Dharma Pala, the, the protectors of, of the Dharma. Um, and so he is, he's usually associated with one or another of the major deities as a sort of wrathful aspect of that deity and, and a protector of that, of that particular deity's wisdom. So um, I won't go and tell you, you know, these are all emanations of, of, of other deities in their very, these in their various forms are emanations uh, of other deities, but it's the third one here, um, the one that I'll show you again, um, that is closest to the, the inspiration for, for Sherpa's spirit figure. 
Um, this is the one of those four paintings. This is the one that is Nebelese, and it and it is this form of Mahakala that directly inspired Sherpa. And in fact, so Sherpa talks about when he was young, going regularly to a temple um, of Mahakala in Kathmandu with his grandmother, and seeing this um, this large stone image of of Mahakala um, over and over again. And it was it was that memory that led him to. Um, lend Mahakala's face to his original 2009 spirit painting that is that sort of kicks off the exhibition. Um, okay, back into the galleries for the for the third of these. Um, um, this is a, a blurry panoramic picture that I took, but it allowed me to show you um, sort of in almost end to end of the galleries, and and you'll probably not be surprised to know that it's. Um, these two that, that I um, want to highlight. And, um, you know, the, the, so the painting on the right um, is, is the one other of Sherpa's works in our collection that is not in the exhibition. It's not in the exhibition because it's not from his spirits uh, corpus, his spirit series, but rather from another one of his series um, that he calls his fragments. And, and I really, I think, um, without... Well, with bias, right, but but also um, as objectively as I can be, I think it's really the 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 sort of best of his fragments, paintings, and of course is in our collection and featured in Awaken. Um, and there, um, it it served this a similar purpose to to sort of what I'm doing now. Is it's sort of a uh, it was a sort of um, preview to um, to a deity that you eventually um, encountered in Awaken this um, large wooden sculpture also in our collection. And, and I'm really excited. This is the first time that I've gotten to show both of these in the same space. Even within Awaken, they were you know, separated by several mini galleries. Um, but the fragmentary image of, of Sherpa's painting is a, sort of, is a fragmented um, image of this deity, Vajrabhaira, of the Lightning Terror. Um, who is one of Tibetan Buddhism's really one of the handful of the most important meditation uh, in the in the tradition, and um, he so he is a wrathful emanation of, of a bodhisattva, of a peaceful benevolent bodhisattva called Manjushri, the, the bodhisattva of wisdom, and so um, in short. Uh, Vajrabhairava embodies the the victory of spiritual wisdom over death. Um, he, he tramples uh, figures symbolizing delusions and attachments. He wears a garland of severed heads um, representing the conquest of ego. With his, the weapons in his 34 hands, he destroys the various obstacles to enlightenment. Um, there's a, a, a sort of origin myth of him, that, of how Manjushri, um, in order to... Um, well, Manjushri turns himself into a big mirror and tells the god of death, Yama, to look, hey, Yama, look over here, look at me. And, and Yama, the god of death, sees himself in this mirror of wisdom. And, um, and what Manjushri is doing is he's making Yama, the, the god of death, confront himself and, and confront the reality of his own impermanence. And the, the boiled down gist of, of all of this is that the goal of the meditator who meditates upon Vajrabhairava, um, the goal is, is to, um, to, to come to terms with the reality of, of one's own mortality and, and thereby conquer, as, as, as Manjushri did, as, as Vajrabhairava, for one to conquer one's own um, sort of fear of, of, of the basic anxiety that we all have. You know our impending death. So the idea is that that through Vajrabhairava, um, we we get okay with with the reality of of, of our own mortality. Um, so there you have it. I think I've left a few minutes for questions. If oh, and and this is a reminder. Please, please go see Sherpa over and over. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, John Henry. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. Um, very much, you know, it's, I, I love, of course, the Sherpa exhibition and always love to see our permanent collection, but really seeing, you know, how 
other artists has taken the you know, traditional, um, I don't know, taking the tradition of deities and, and put them in the modern settings yeah. is really um, fascinating. It's interesting. And um, I, I really like how you put them side to side, even on the screen. Um, you know, seeing in person is great too. I'm in the galleries, but I like it on the screen as well. So yeah. we do yeah. have some um, questions. Oh, oh sorry. Good. Yeah, I was just going to say it, it was fun to, to, you know, pull things from the collection and get them into the gallery that, that one or another, that in one or another way might um, relate to the, to the Sherpa material. I mean, I think it is, it isn't that, that, that one, you know, that I was able to put four Mahakalas in there and, and yeah. able to use his painting along with the sculpture, you know, it's, it's a signal of, you know, we actually do have quite a lot of depth in, the, in this collection and it's, it's fun to be able to yeah, this things and show. Thank you. So we've got two questions. I'll, I'll, the first one is, um, what do the colors used in uh, Saren Sherpa's exhibition, I guess um, maybe in some of the works that are um, that he has, do they mean anything? There's black, blue, white, et cetera. That's one of the questions. So I guess because the colors are so vibrant, are there, is there symbolism? Well, um, so, so they are, com they're coming you know, a lot of those colors and their uses are coming out of the tradition. So, you know, by the time uh, Sherpa starts doing contemporary work, um, um, he, you know, he's been a traditional painter and painted these deities over and over again for some, I don't know, 25, 30 years. So um, those colors, like much of the iconography, is coming directly out of the tradition. But, but Sherpa is, um, he's, he is Adam. It's too strong a word, but but he's he's resolute, or I guess, and, and in in saying that you know, when 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 a lot of that material is entering his his work, that it's it's losing, it's it's not necessarily holding on to those sort of re reasons, explanations, and and instead is 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 sort of being offered up um, for for every particular viewer's. Um, you know, it, it's it's their sort of interpretations of his imagery that are important to him, um, rather than the sort of okay, red means such and such. You know, rather than telling people um, what the various imagery colors um, are supposed to mean. So, so yes, in the tradition, um, various colors are associated with various things. Um, most um, commonly. Uh, uh, with the directions, um, with the five directions, so the four um, cardinal directions plus the center, um, each each color is associated. But but then that that goes on and on and on. The, you know, it's um, associated with the five wisdoms and the five poisons. And the, so yes, the colors are meaningful in the traditional material um, in many many ways. Um, but within with, within Sherpa's paintings, they they really are meant to be um, sort of open. Okay, um, and before I go to the other, another person had a question, but this same person had a couple follow-up questions. So uh, as you were talking, and so they wanted to know, that they were asking if the colors are, are they not then related to the Tibetan prayer flags? Yeah. So again, absolutely, I mean, yeah. yes. Um, um, so that's that the, the prayer flags and the five colors of the prayer flags um, are associated with, you know, it's it's yet another sort of nested level of meaning in in this color symbolism. Right, um, and and someone else on the tour asked, uh, what type of meditation are people practicing when looking at these terrifying deities? Oh, uh, um, you well, okay. So so I, I will I will um, hedge this answer by saying I don't you know I I'm not a scholar or a practitioner there for that matter. Of, of Tibetan Buddhism, so my, my knowledge is fragmentary. But um, ordinarily for, the, for so the, the, the sort of more, in general, generally speaking, the more terrifying the deity, the more esoteric the teachings are that are associated with it. So fewer, the more terrifying the, being, the deity, the fewer people have access to it at all, to be able to see it at all, um, and, and to be taught what what meanings, what teachings are encoded in it. So um, 
when you get to these most terrifying deities, it's only a small number of people um, who, who have access to them and, and who um, are taught about them by higher ups. Um, but that's, but that's, that's usually the way that it works is you are being led, you're being taught by, um, by a more learned person who, who understands uh, all the meaning in the, in, in the symbolism. Um, you're sort of being led on a meditation of, of looking uh, at, at the object and, and being taught all that it means. So, so it's, um, it's, it's a guided meditation. Right. And there is um, another question that's come here and actually uh, kind of connects with, there are two people that have asked a question about um, uh, Tara. So um, this person's thanking you uh, for your tour and uh, appreciates the connection between images with meditation practices um, and asks if there's a connection between um, Tara and the goddess shown here. And there was another person that also asked about. So, yes. so Tara, um, yeah. okay, so this, I guess this is coming up in part, well, you know, there's the, the one um, Sherpa painting Tara Gaga that, that um, right. Tara sort of makes an appearance um, to some degree. Um, so Tara, Tara didn't come up in the talk because she's obviously, she's not a wrathful. She's so, so, you know, for all of these wrathful images, images and deities, there are as many, you know, there's, there's the flip side when I'm talking about these dualities. There's a whole lot of um, peaceful uh, imagery in Tibetan art and teaching as well. And so Tara obviously is on the peaceful side of, of, of well, usually on the peaceful side of, of the, the pantheon and teachings. Um, there are, there are semi-wrathful and maybe even, Tara comes in a lot of emanations and there might be some wrathful um, um, uh, appearances of her, but, but she's, you know, generally known as this, you know, Tara is known as, as the sort of most, um, nurturing and, and gentle of, 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 uh, Tibetan Buddhist deities. Um, so is that, I mean, so no, there's no direct connection between Tara and, um, and Vajravarahi, uh, who we've looked at, um, but certainly within within the you know within the teachings, I'm I I am sure that that those two could be used right in, in, in a larger teaching of saying you know here are two very different sorts of beings and um, they're very different, but in the end, are they that different? Sort of you know bigger teaching. So yes, I'm I'm sure that Tara is is in the teachings paired with wrathfuls in order to make a point. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, obviously you've inspired some, some questions and people thinking about that and we've appreciated your time, John Henry and your time. All right, thank you, Luvon, and thanks. All right, everybody. thank you everyone.